we've invited Bill Swarns to go ahead and share a couple of Memorial Day memories with us today. Uh, Bill's service record is stellar himself. Uh, he uh, does not brag on it much, but one of the things that our government tasked him with is flying a device that never had any business flying. You can look at them and tell that won't fly. <laughs> and yet somehow he managed to do it. Uh, Bill, share with us from your heart. Well, first of all, thank everyone who came out yesterday. I mean, it helped my morale a thousand souls. It felt good. We had 24 people out there placing flags, 500 flags. And I know because my son counted. But I asked him to come and get this year before we have a little more help than we had five last year. So we don't the flags out. He has a bad back. He's been worried about this year. And we're at 24. That includes a couple of little cheerleaders like me. And uh, yeah, everybody else. But yesterday was just a great day for us. I was asked again yesterday, a couple of years ago, to say, why are we putting flags in every headstone? And that goes back to 11 years ago. One August 2010, my mother in law passed away. Uh, and she lived with us out there in the cemetery. Six months later, my wife passed away from a cancer, pancreatic cancer. We had a great line Mother's Day celebration at my house that day, and then we came over here to the cemetery. Flags and flowers were over their graves. I looked around and, I, and there were some scattered flags up there. I said, well, we need to do that for everybody here. We don't know the suffering that the wives and children went through, and I know your husbands, especially today. And so we started that tradition uh, 11 years ago. And I hope that continues. And I doubt last year, we actually reinforced that the congregation came together. Two stories I'm going to talk about, uh, two personalities. One was uh, Reggie Martis, an immigrant from Scotland, came here in the 30s at the height of our depression. Things weren't even weren't as good uh, as they were in Scotland when he came here. He was working in Cleveland uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, <coughs> when we declared war on Germany. Six national cemeteries just in France. And the total is about 26 cemeteries throughout the world. So Reggie was buried in one of those. Never met him. Good man. My wife met him, but she was less than two years old when he passed away. My mother in law.
thinking ahead to another personality, representative of many. Sergeant White was a helicopter crew chief, the real heroes of every engagement. We had, we had eight Marines, the pilots of Marines, the track, the rounders. side of the ocean.
Memorial Day, my father-in-law, who I never met, I think a lot, living artist, Sergeant White, served, and we honor the memory of those who did not return. Lord, we pray for the day that all warfare would stop, but until that day we praise you for raising up those who stand in the gap. Father, we remember those of our own loved ones, of our own community, those who stood up so that we could stand. And Father, we thank you for those sacred memories today. Lord, as we face an uncertain world, an uncertain future, a grieving world, as we mourn the loss of precious children for no good reason today. Lord, you alone are our help and our redeemer when our hearts are aching and breaking. And so, Father, we trust you with this day and all days to come. Hear us as we call out to you now those needs and names that are closest to our souls today. Paul? Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. 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 Lord, in your mercy. And teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have twice as many fiddle players here this week as we had last week. I think a real mathematician could help me figure out if we go on doubling
him the number of pivotal players we have. I, I think within a couple of years we can get to 2,000. Double the number. Geometric. Yeah, absolutely. But for right now, let's go with it. Well, actually, it's just going to be Casey. He's going to do a special thing for you. And uh, this is where anybody who wants to do can participate in the program. And she's been involved over for many years. And I've seen her come a long way over many years. So I think this will be a treat for you. This will be truly special music. So. All right. So Casey is going to be the one fiddle player, but she's going to play twice as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, she is currently attending CMU, double major in music education and music performance. Mm -hmm.
could long endure. The first shots in the Civil War were fired at <coughs> Fort Sumter, South Carolina, which fell within two days of bombardment and involved no loss of life on either part. After that easy and bloodless victory, the Southern generals boasted that it would be a quick and easy war and that the troops would be home by Christmas. They were wrong. The first organized land battle of the war was <clears throat> fought in Philippi, Virginia, now West Virginia. Philippi, a sleepy little village, the first battle of the Civil War was fought there for reasons not clear to science, art, or religion. Nobody quite can figure out why Philippi. But that's where the first shots were fired with a, a land-based organized battle. The battle was accidentally started early when a neighbor woman fired a volley of pistol shots to, as a warning, and that was the cue that the Union Army had to open fire. So it started early, but they began to fire down upon a rebel encampment, and uh, it turns out that most of the Southerners were green recruits so green that they hadn't bothered to post a guard outside their encampment that night. The, fire, the shooting woke them from a sound sleep, and they ran off into the woods, scattering, many of them still in their bedclothes. The newspapers nicknamed it not the Philippine Battle, but the Philippine Races because of how fast the Southerners run. And after that battle, the Union generals boasted that this was a great victory and that the war would soon be over. And they were wrong. Four years later, the war officially ended when Lee surrendered to Grant here in Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse. The last battle of the Civil War, however, took place two months later in Texas. Apparently it takes Texans a while to quit fighting. But in that dreadful four years, America lost two and a half percent of its total population. Just to put that in perspective, that would be seven million people today. And the Commonwealth of Virginia houses today about two and a half percent of the population of America. So it would be as if every soul in Virginia was wiped from the map. It was a time when nearly everyone lost someone. And in the South, especially, although all over the nation, but in the South, you know, April flower, April showers bring May flowers. And as soon as the flowers began to bloom in May, it was the habit for people, especially the women, to go and decorate the graves with the flowers of spring. In the Gospels, it was the women who came first to the tomb of Jesus to honor his memory. And so it is in real life as well. It tends to be the women who come to the graveyards to honor the memory of those who have fallen. It wasn't long before people all over the nation began to honor the tombs of all soldiers, not just the ones that were on one side or another, but honoring all of those who fell in that struggle. And so Decoration Day became Memorial Day. 
Today there are over two dozen cities that claim to have been the first place in America that Memorial Day was observed. And their own right. It was an upsurge from among all of the nation. Just an upswelling from the soil of the earth saying we need to honor those who have fallen. It took a hundred years for Memorial Day to become official in the United States. Perhaps that's because we kept having more wars crop up to grief. It became important for folks to remember those sacrifices. And for some, the impermanence of flowers was not enough of a seed of healing and hope. So today, there are memorials of stone and steel and glass all over the landscape. There are memorials to the war to end all wars in Kansas City and Washington, D.C. Today we call that war the First World War. Soon there came the Second World War and there were there are monuments to memorial as that and D-Day. There are monuments in honor of Korean War veterans. The Forgotten War, they call Korea. In Washington, the Korean War Veterans Memorial has stainless steel soldiers and ponchos ever vigilant to remember those who sacrificed their lives. The Vietnam War, startling in its starkness and its power, has slabs of granite into which thousands of unforgettable names are etched in stone. Now plans are underway for monuments to those we lost in Desert Storm and Desert Shield as well. There's a, uh, a new monument in Washington that you might not have heard of. It's not well known. It opened in 2022, I'm sorry, 2020, at the height of the pandemic. So there wasn't a large gathering, there wasn't much fanfare, and not many people are visiting it yet. And the folks who built it are okay with that. They never meant it to be a crowd-drawing entertainment place. It is the, the Veterans Memorial for Native American veterans. It's honoring all of those who served and fell for this land. From the Revolutionary War to the current day, Native people have volunteered for armed service in greater percentages than any other ethnic group in America. And there are those outsiders who will tell you that's because we honor war and glorify war. Anybody who thinks war is glorious has never served there, have they, Colonel? They'll tell you it's because we're a warrior culture and we glorify that. That's not what our Native American veterans say. We, as a culture, have never glorified war for war's sake, and in fact, there are those Native American communities where if you have shed blood, if you have killed an enemy, you are no longer allowed to participate in tribal celebrations or dances. And people from those communities where those warriors are excluded still volunteer to be warriors. 
They do so knowing the cost, but they do so to remember those who stood before them. They do so if you ask them why. They say it's because this is the land where our grandparents' bones are buried. And we honor their memory. We honor them for standing in the gap for us. We honor them and their memory so much that we are willing to pay the price to stand in their honor. There are those who say that America is now at war with herself and uh, the fabric of this nation is now tested once again to see whether we can long endure as it has not been since the 1860s. But at a time like this, at a time of national grieving like this, at a time of national pain, at a time of deep confusion and voices on all sides raising their rebel crowds, cries, I don't put my, my hope in princes or politicians or pundits. I put my hope in the power of Memorial Day because it turns out that those sacred memories are more powerful than any conflict this world has ever seen. Those sacred memories have greater power for seeds of healing and hope than anything this world can do. So we honor today those who served. We especially honor those who fell in that service, those who stood in the gap and in many cases, those who came home did so because somebody else stood up to protect them. We honor those who paid that ultimate price that we might enjoy ultimate freedom. But we do not honor them alone. For every one of them who stood in harm's way, there were at least 100 here at home who stood for them, who prayed for them, who cared for them, who embraced them as they went to stand and wept for them when they came home. For every one that went, there are a hundred who were touched by their sacrifice on a deeply personal level. We honor each of them for their service as well, and that's why we honor every grave. We also honor the warriors of the cross. We honor those who stood for Jesus Christ. We honor those who erected this place as a place of faith and peace and healing for you. We honor their sacrifice. We honor them standing in the gap and giving of their own blood, sweat, and tears that we might have this place to come and pray and find God's grace. One more word about that last monument I mentioned, the Native American Memorial. It was not designed to be a place of public fanfare. It was not designed to draw crowds. It was designed to draw in people from the four corners to come in and seek healing for this land. So I think it could rightly be called a sanctuary. That's precisely why we gather on this Memorial Day in sanctuaries across the land. That's why we gather in this chapel today. There are those who lie just outside these walls who did stand in the gap when it was time to stand for freedom. And we honor their memories today, but we also honor this day as we honor Christ's power to finally wipe away our final tears, to finally rid this war of rid this world of bloodshed and war. 
and finally set us free indeed. We pray for that day to come, and in the meanwhile, we celebrate the sacred memories, and we honor them as the best way to heal this land and receive God's healing hand. Today, we celebrate sacred memories. Before we close, I know you all have many Memorial Day memories as well. I, I remember my uncle from Miller, Midge, to the family, uh, who, before he was deployed to World War II, bought a new Harley Davidson with his his first paycheck and claimed he didn't know where the brakes were. <laughs> so he drove it round and round and round the family house over and over and over until he ran out of gas. You can see where I might have some kinship with him. We last heard of him on the day before D Day. And we honor his memory today. Are there others you'd like to call out now? Uncle Ray, Ray Radical. Uncle Ruzan Gibbons, one of the Lord of Three Purple Hearts. My uncle was uh, Harlan Wayne Davidson, who died in college. A friend, Jim Delaney, who was killed in Vietnam. I have two that I'm especially thinking about. My, my dad, who, of course, flew in World War II and uh, in Vietnam, and then uh, been thinking a lot about my commander uh, during the invasion of Iraq, Colonel John Jones, who developed brain cancer while deployed and passed away. And he's up at Arlington now. Once again, we honor all of those who stood in the gap when we could not stand for ourselves. We honor those who answered that call to freedom, even if it cost them the ultimate price. We honor the fact that they brought America farther along toward the shining goal that God has set before us. For most of America's history, those Native American veterans I shared with you shared something in common with Bill's father-in-law. They were not U.S. citizens when they volunteered to serve. And when, uh, when I said this morning, uh, create two or three real Americans, I was, I was hoping that Virgie would get flooded because she had to <clears throat> take a test to become an American. You didn't. <laughs> Hundred questions, all American history. Yes. I we did 100% perfect. <laughs> I would expect nothing less. <laughs> This great 
land of thine arts has always been a welcoming land. And though we've had some hiccups along the way, and though we've gone by starts and stops, and though there are questions now about how that all works, we are welcoming more people to be Americans than ever before. And America is a richer, stronger place because of it. And because of that, we have even more people willing to stand shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, and stand in the gap for those who cannot stand for themselves. Today we remember all of that as we celebrate our strength on Memorial Day. Colonel Bell, I feel like uh, you, you need, well, yeah, I've got two colonels here. I don't know which one of you holds rank. He, he managed to fly things that shouldn't be flown, but I, you, you're still in service. No. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're retired. It doesn't count. You, you still go into... Anyway. Uh, I will call on you all to give the words of benediction, but for right now, our closing hymn... Number 697, America. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 